What an amazing adventure this has been. We feel privileged to have been a part of it and would love to share it with you. Like a patchwork quilt, we have tried to fit together a few hundred random video clips into a story that somewhat reflects our journey. Not so easy. I am so grateful for the guidance received from the initial idea to conclusion. So, our patchwork is now complete. Thank you for all music copyright permissions as indicated. This video is dedicated to the Cathy Freeman Foundation and all who have walked this journey, the Australian Alps walking track, whether just one section or the entire trail, to all who have shared your personal journey by way of YouTube video or blog, we thank you too. Many thanks to John and Monica Chapman and John Seisman for their fantastic Australian Alps walking track book of which I have two copies. We also thank all trail management teams, Parks Victoria and New South Wales and all other Australian Alps workers. Our main focus was to raise 10,000 for the Cathy Freeman Foundation. This has been difficult and a journey of its own. Because of each of you, we have achieved our target. So to us, it's much more than a fantastic hiking challenge. I also thank my friends and colleagues from the Metropolitan Fire Brigade for your tremendous encouragement, donations and support. I won't mention names, you know who you are. Our biggest challenges were very little experience in the bush or on any trail whatsoever, an extremely tight schedule, snow, freezing cold nights and high winds, heavy packs, 18 to 25 kilograms plus water, a little sickness, a few injuries, and for me, a couple of bulging discs to deal with. We must be mad. The rain pours down as we arrive early into Walhalla, a beautiful Victorian town, 183 kilometers east of Melbourne, a town of great historical value, now a tourist destination. Just 12 months ago, it seemed that all the time in the world was at our disposal. Yet faster than could be imagined, the day has arrived. We gather in the rotunda opposite the Star Hotel, the official start of the Australian Alps walking track for the launch. Uh, we are gathered here today to uh, launch the fundraising event one step at a time for the Cathy Freeman Foundation. I'd like to now welcome you all here to the land and the country of the Gunai Kurnai people. And I know Trevor is extremely passionate about not only the walk, but also about the work we do at the foundation. Um, the Cathy Freeman Foundation has a vision of an Australia where Indigenous and non-Indigenous students have the same education standards and opportunities in life. The MFB has a proud history in of more than 125 years in servicing the community and part of that is supporting other organisations and charities. It's a big part of what we do and something that we are truly passionate about. Well I'm in awe of you taking on the, the challenge. I'm, uh, I'm jealous because I would like to do it, <laughs> do it myself. May the Valley of the Gods and the Spirit of the Gods from the Valley be with you on your journey ahead. About a year ago I met Trevor at a work living in fire conference where he said to me, want to do the Australian Open walking trail? And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Hopefully we are um, well prepared and we can deal with whatever is thrown at us. I wish you all the best. It, uh, it's going to be a real test in the first few days. Of course, we've had a very, very late snow season this year with some really good snow in the last, uh, in the last few weeks and that's still up there. Just don't post photographs of your feet at the end, OK? I hope the spirit of uh, Buran the Creator flies, flies with you and looks after you and a lot of you and um, I'd like to wish you all the best of luck with that trek and to the Foundation for helping out uh, Aboriginal children. After many months of training and preparations it's hard to believe that we're actually leaving. As expected, we head off late with a big day ahead. We cross Mormontan track and head along high above the stunning Thompson River and on towards Poverty Point Bridge. We've come from 
rain wear and raincoats to sunshine and waterfalls. Poverty Point Bridge was built in England and erected in 1901. This bridge um, we're about to walk over was built to enable access to the Erica side of Thompson River um, so that they could um, get access for their timber workers. And um, this is a lovely sign that of course mentions the unfortunate tragedies that happened in um, the area in the 1900s. After falling into disrepair following the closure of the gold mines, it was redecked in 1976. Italian woodcutters once lived in a settlement near the bridge, which was named Poverty Point. A great table and chairs. <laughs> So now we're turning away from the Thompson River, climbing up over the spur to Oshears Mill. Up we go. Whoops, not going anywhere. We're walking, working hard, climbing up to the Thompson Valley Road. It's a long, long way up, pretty steep. We're at Fingerboard Spur. We've just had quite a bit of a climb up. We've done 11 kilometres. The ascent is immediately followed by a long descent to our lunch destination, Oshears Mill, and the second last bush toilet for quite some time. A drop toilet is a luxury to an Alps hiker. Oshears Mill was a sawmill from 1919 to 1930. With our first lunch devoured, we crossed the East Tyres River. Everyone finds a few blood suckers somewhere on their body but they don't seem to bother Karen too much at all. She flicks them off like she's done this before. Eight kilometers and 715 meters ascent later, we finally arrive at Mount Erica Car Park, a really tough finish to the first day of our journey. So we've done like nearly- to say it's tough, but there's gonna to be tougher. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So how do you feel? Knowing that we've come to the top of the, the rise of day one, about 1,200 metres climb. Let the smiles talk. <laughs> <laughs> it um, was a very good day and we got to camp in plenty of time and the campsite was absolutely gorgeous. We arrived and it wasn't too long before we saw our first lyrebird. Please note that our distances given are taken from our GPS units, which all indicate very similar numbers. The numbers vary a little from the good book. We are confident that the charts and figures given are correct. However, as explained to us, the elevation charts demonstrate distances in a straight line as the crow flies, without taking into consideration ascents and descents. Just a quick example, Red Jacket to the top of Mount Victor track is about 3.2 kilometers in a straight line, as indicated in the book. But when walked, from a lower elevation to a much higher elevation, a longer distance will obviously be recorded on your GPS. Also, losing the track, backtracking and searching for water regularly adds distance. Where are um, we seriously going from here? We're going up there. So we believe that our numbers are close to correct, but are happy to be corrected. So it's now the start of day two, which um, I have to admit I'm a little nervous about because we've got big, massive uphill. Today we got to start with some beautiful sunshine on our walk and some amazing scenery. We got to walk through uh, the forest of the ferns, which was quite magical. And now we've entered the realm of these amazing, magnificent rocks. The climb to Mount Erica Summit is long, steepish and a first significant milestone. Talbot Hut site, now only a chimney, is a great place for lunch. Plenty of beautiful pure mountain water to get us through the day. This is the stream that feeds the Talbot Hut Ruins campsite and allegedly we've never seen this much water here before. That is awesome. So we're now leaving the Talbot Hut ruined site, a magnificent place, and we're heading off for Mount Whitelaw Hut ruins. Could it be the track, but it looks like it goes. 
It's a bit kind of odd because... We continue to take turns leading the intense uphill snow climbs. Our shoes and socks have become completely soaked and our legs fatigued as the hours pass by. Oh wow! Uh -huh. We continue to fall through to depths of between 6 inches and 3 feet and wonder whether we will ever make our destination today. Later than expected and after considerable effort we arrive at Mount St Pillock. We have been walking in the snow for almost a K from where we stopped. All my troubles seem so far away. Now it seems so that you're kidding me. We finally arrive at Mount Whitelaw Hut site, cold, wet, and exhausted. Karen lights a great fire in our fabulous old standing chimney and we all erect our tents with urgency. At some point Karen burns holes through her socks. I think today was definitely a lot tougher than yesterday was, uh, but it was definitely well worth it. It was absolutely spectacular. So here we go, we're going to mark off day number two, which we don't have to do again. Okay, good night everybody. There is so much to do each morning to prepare for the day and much of it happens in the tent. Change clothes, check the weather, record in the journal, have breakfast and wash cooking and eating Fill utensils. Fill water containers if possible and double check the day's likely water check sources, maps and details, dressings, sun creams, pack all equipment into backpacks, sleeping. We believe this is where Kylie inhabits. This is Trevor's tent. Always check area for items overlooked. This morning we tried to leave by 8am. Come on, ladies. But struggled to be ready <laughs> by 9.25. We soon find more snow and are relieved after a few hours to see the last of it behind us. Yeah, we've been following a wombat here, so we know we're in the right path. Kylie's in front. She's uh, setting a good pace, which we need. 10 or 11 minutes per kilometre. <laughs> Arriving at Stronach's camp, Karen and Kylie spot a white ran container visible near a tree. Please do not open or remove. This food is required for survival. Food drop for Australian Alpine walking track solo attempt. With a forest of mature mountain ash, blackwood and Myrtle Beach. However, due to recent fires, we soon discover a forest of many hundreds of fire-killed ash. Still got like almost 15 kilometers to go. We're currently doing um, 0 0.05 kilometers per hour. We do not want to know the time. Man, this is, this is getting ridiculous. We pass Trig Point, at which time a relief and break is short-lived. It's down, 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 slippery loose gravel, tests our agility again. Steep, <laughs> steep. <laughs> I mean, that was good time. <sighs> oh, that almost was too. And Finally, we reach the beautiful Eastern Dam and the journey for the day is almost over but not yet. It's a 25 kilometre day and it has been intense. Two kilometres later we spot the Alps marker for the Thompson River Trail and descend to the river bank expecting to walk straight across the log Yeah, bridge. so just looking at options further up whether there's, I don't know, but that looks way steep. If that current's not too strong and if it's not too slippery we might be able to work our way up across there. That was just one of Trevor's water bottles going down the stream. This river crossing is our biggest challenge yet and finally oh. I decide to show the oh. ladies how it's done but no harm done, just a little short lived pain in a certain place. I was feeling a little bit okay about this until seeing Trevor doing it, now I'm feeling a little bit not okay about doing it. We are on track, even if once again into our campsite at dusk. We're all very tired and need a very good sleep.
Good morning. We're about to start off from day four. We have 23 kilometers and lots of climb and a lot of descent. The ascent to the summit of Mount Easton is immediate from our camp. Lactic acid takes some time to clear and our leg muscles are burning with various limbs, feet and toes suffering from the huge effort of yesterday. Wow, this is approaching the top of Mount Easton. That's a huge climb. When over the summit we pause and I stretch my tight hamstrings and calves whilst Karen restraps her feet. It's very cold. I'm just dealing with the cold. <laughs> After some very pleasant relief from the constant climbing, we relax into some undulating alpine track. However, before we know it, we descend and ascend some extremely steep fire trails. One photo that I go, okay, I'm having a very long, slow decline. How's the feet, Karen? Oh, yeah, a bit sore. It was pretty steep going there. And before we know, we reach Blue Jacket and soon after Red Jacket, all forgotten gold mining towns near Violet Town. I am like a wandering Jew, continually roving. I've travelled during winters, two winters and one summer, 350 miles every month of these seasons. Some on foot and on other occasions on horseback. Like our journey. It does, doesn't it? Red Jacket Cemetery was a moment of reflection as we consider the lives of those who were buried here long ago. Their lives, like ours currently, will live day to day without many comforts. Family, the O'Keefe's. Michael O'Keefe Senior appears to be the... He had died in 1894. January but 1880 and he was only 12 years old. And Nathaniel died on the 13th of August. Often the women would outlive their husbands and children. And then we're off again. We're walking up Victor Spur. The first kilometre very steep. We lose the track a number of times due to trees down and overgrown sections but continue on the ridge until the foot track appears again. The prospect of arriving at Mount Victor, our first food and equipment drop and the end of stage one was very motivating. What an amazing view and uh, pretty much encompasses where we've come from. So over the Thompson Dam, up Ball Ball, all the way up and up and up and down and down and up and up and up and up and down. You know, challenges embraced by the three of us. It's just been such an incredible experience. So kind of a little bit sad to be leaving now. There's a part of me jealous of that rest of the trek to Canberra. <laughs> Gone from the torrential rain at the launch into mm. mud and streams down tracks. We've lost our tracks. Oh, you know, the snow was probably an absolute highlight because it was something I didn't expect to encounter. I uh, wasn't sure we were prepared for and I think, uh, I think we managed that really, really well. We are on a mission to make it to Thara near Canberra by Saturday the 11th of November, Remembrance Day. It is critical that Karen is back to work on the following Monday in Melbourne with Parks Victoria for fire season duties. See you in Canberra. We have no time to spare, no allowance for injury, sickness or any other reason. Troubling news. I have just realised having studied today's itinerary and maps that I have completely omitted one full day. The itinerary should have read Mount Victor to Black River, not Mount Victor to Rump Saddle, and immediately places us one day behind. Very bad news. <laughs> I'm stuck, I'm still tired. Karen is loaded up with works, like a hamburger with a lot. Her pack is so heavy that she can hardly lift it high enough to slide her arms in. Well, Dr. Ware, where are we? That's a very good question. We are somewhere on the Australian Alpine walking track and we'll find Black River. We take the time to don our water shoes to cross the Black River and feel satisfied with our day's journey. Gorgeous river though, look how clean the water is. We check our notes and maps and realise that we have completely missed a hard to spot turn off to another river crossing point some distance back up the very steep descent. We backtrack across the river again, rather annoyed with ourselves for following our noses and the obvious track rather than the guide back track. Up the hill again. Yeah. Back over the river, up the hill. And there goes Mill. Hey. She's doing well. We are tired and it's been another pretty hard day. And we've still got to cross the river again and find the campground. Over here, this log. Chuck them that side. 
From here, a number of mistakes are made due to the confusing nature of the difficult-to-find tracks and crossings. Camilla has done extremely well after earlier struggling with pack weight. Finally, we are in the right place. After being lost for a little while, blaming the GPS and our book reading, but in fact, all is well. We're tired and about two hours late. After another two hours along what seems a never-ending awkward foot track, we arrive at our campsite. It's dusk, almost 8 p.m., and head torches glowing. I have not slept well for a few nights and must have a solid sleep tonight to continue. The sound of the water rushing over rocks and around a bend is very relaxing. I'll listen to it for hours. Neither Camilla or I slept last night. We need to sleep in, but Karen is keen to get a move on, so we compromise. I announce my continuation is in doubt. If I cannot eat or sleep, we'll have to quit. Karen and Camilla are stunned. After a late start, Karen and Camilla search for the exit trail which crosses the river. The trail seems to lead into some thick scrub and blackberries. There is so much blackberry. I found a bottle which says that we were probably on the right track. Um, the bottle is a wide brim bottle which was rather what I was after so I've successfully done my shopping for the morning. Now just after 11am we venture downstream through the river and yes it is the marker. Fantastic. Today's climb is supposed to be 1240 metres with 565 metres descent. Found another marker. <laughs> the girls have gone party. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to go viral, right? <laughs> <laughs> we leave Black River and push onwards, up and up and up and up and up. The trail becomes an overgrown old road, and the fire regeneration in places make it thick and hard going. Finally, we make it to the top. We thought, but there was more and more and more. So we cannot see any of this prickly acacia that has been stabbing us in the arms, legs and, and face for the last hour or so. Oh, oh, just more like three hours. Three hours, yeah. <laughs> and we are at a mountain that has a name that starts with... Shilling. 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 It's been another tough day. Completely different than the first four, but just as tough. Weary but relieved, we march along the road at a great pace and finally and luckily discover a trickle of water in a gully amongst tree ferns about three kilometres further. We need this water badly. Yes. And to my surprise, relief and delight find a most suitable area one kilometre ahead. I return and report the good news and the ladies are happy. Yesterday at um, Black River was uh, probably a deepest moment for me. I was ready to go home, not sleeping all night. And uh, Camilla didn't sleep well either. We're going too hard, too fast. But we're still there, we're hanging in there. The nights have been generally very cold, averaging between minus three and plus five degrees Celsius. We continue up Jamison Lacola Road towards Rumpf Saddle, hoping to find more water there. Camilla suddenly presses her hand to her stomach and leans forward in pain. We pause. Camilla has another episode of pain. We rest for a while and are now wondering whether we need medical assistance. Miller's on the ground looking distressed. We've just walked down a horrendous kilometre of rocky rocky. Whoa! <laughs> Rum saddle is nothing like we expected. We're just getting out of a, a dense um, overgrown uh, track down to a water source and have a guess what there was no water there a litre and a half each left so we just have to sip it's been a really nice road so far it's gentle um, road going downhill though I believe if we're heading to a mountain we're probably Mill marches on like a trooper along Middle Ridge Road and then Mount McKinchy Road. She's hard to keep up with now. The stomach pain has eased. She's tough. I think Karen is just making sure she gets down without injury. So we don't end up... 
yeah, not doing anything to spoil the trip here on this hill. Four hours later, after some exhausting climbing, eventually catching up with Mill, we pass Peter's Gorge and then the Gorge. Mill's been leading the way for a few hours now, keeping us going. We've got five k's ahead to get to Mount Sunday and we're working very hard. Yes. We are very tired and now camped on the peak of Mount McKinty having enjoyed a magnificent sunset. Karen is losing her voice and her chest sounds very raspy now. I'm feeling much better. We have not found another water source since way back at our Fern Gully, so we've kept some reserves for the morning to low saddle. If that reliable water source is dry, then we're in trouble. Great conditions, nice flat ground, and plenty of rabbit stew, I mean poo, around. A beautiful hilltop. Perfect for camping, no water. I definitely have some infection of some st type because I've got a killer sore throat and a blocked nose and I keep blowing out ye lovely yellowy green and orange gum. Huh? My bowl last night was attacked by an animal <laughs> and it has teeth marks in it huh? and it has holes in it. It's 8.20am as we leave this beautiful campsite and continue marching on towards Mount Sunday, ever on the lookout for a little water. Camilla's just been so strong and uh, pulling me along. Karen's not feeling well at all. We have now all but run out of water. We scoop up some muddy puddle water and can treat that if absolutely necessary. Sorry to be annoying, but I think I should probably put my gators on for snakes around here. It's pretty snakey sure. sort of stuff. And we swing north, then east, and finally south, down a steep overgrown trail with many fallen trees. The map indicates a water source to the west of our location, but goodness, it looks to be an incredibly steep descent down a deep valley. We encounter a number of steep rock face drop-offs, which appear out of nowhere, forcing us to backtrack up and around. Often, we can not see what we stand on. And finally, 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 after one hour, reach the bottom. And what do we find? Thirst quenching, fast flowing, clear water. They filled up probably almost 15 plus litres of water to take up the hill and we're heading towards McDonald's. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not the type where I can get a Sunday. And so now we're trying to get out of this monstrous jungle of a place, much I suppose like Kokoda would have been for their, their Australian soldiers. Karen having an affinity with Mother Earth and my self-confidence in the guidance of the spirit, we decided to ask for guidance, trust in the spirit and confidently follow our feelings. We look ahead and up the steep and difficult hillside many times to decide which way next. Where are um, we seriously going from here? We're going up there. No, but I'm going to have a look first. And every time seem to make the right choice. Sweat poured off our faces as we scramble up. But quite quickly, we once again found the Alps track. One step at a time. One step at a time. This was the ultimate bush bashing journey of all time. Nice to have a marker occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a shit step shit from Trevor. Yeah. I can't even talk. We've only got four and a half, five hours to go, so we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. The next few hours test our patience and we test each other's. And we're hoping to get there tonight. I am eating and sleeping well again, but still, my goodness, this has been tough. Camilla wants to race me up the last few hundred metres to the summit. It's obvious where I got my competitive spirit from. Five hours after leaving that deep gully, we stagger to the rocky rooftop of Mount McDonald West Peak. It's near the top. All we've got to do is find some flat ground to camp on. If you love howling winds, you'll be in heaven here. However, be sure not to venture many metres away from your tent on the ridge. To top it off, we had dinner under the stars, but a few minutes later, there was not a soul to be seen as the temperature plummets, threatening to freeze us where we stand. The wind blew a gale last night, 
Drying our tents this morning in strong gusty winds will be quick and complete. Carrying dry tents is of course lighter and much preferred. This is a wonderful high and mighty section of the trail. You can see in all directions across many mountain ranges. The views are amazing and I can tell that Camilla is impressed. We have now entered into the inner circle of the land of Mordor and here's one of the elves. We're now at the middle peak of Mount Macdonald. We've got some beautiful sunshine and a lovely breeze today. Camilla and Karen have been so strong and resilient day after day as was Kylie during the first week. I could not have wanted for better companions. Everywhere we put our feet and our bags, ants just seem to crawl up. We're at the knobs. Now we're going to head way down and yeah. look for High Cone campsite. I'm not doing too well. I think I'm actually getting worse. I'm not getting any better and with um, having to be sparing on water as well, I don't think the dehydration. Helps. Not long afterwards, with the sun still high and piercing, with Karen's voice all but gone, we hear a squeaky yelp. The reeds! Then Trevor came along and I'm like, Trevor, am I delusional? Is this actually water? And Trevor's like, yes, it's water. And we're also heading up there, which was our other water source, but I'm pretty sure I wasn't gonna make that. We continue along Knob's track to the knobs and later past High Cone at a fair pace. Her ankles and feet are being tortured as we cross the side of a steep mountainside for hours on end with gradients of 30 to 40 degrees. We all agree that it may have been better to have climbed over the peaks than cross the face. And we're absolutely hammered. We haven't got to where we wanted. We've been working all day and it's just, you've got to call it Hell's Hill. And the time is? 7.30 p.m. After such an exhausting day, we are shattered that we did not even reach Mount Clear, let alone Chester Yard, thus still one day and three hours behind. Once again, it was dusk or even dark as we reached the summit of Square Top at 15.98 metres. How can we make up a full day's hiking when we cannot even catch up or keep up to the adjusted itinerary? The sky is clear, stars in their millions, the wind picks up, and it's another absolutely freezing and windy night. Strong winds on the high ridge of square top have battered our tents all night. It's 6.30 a.m. We're still three hours plus one day behind. So today we're on a mission to make a huge dent in the deficit. We march on aggressively to the summit of Mount Clear, approaching steeply from the south and then descending even steeper to the north. We are now advancing rapidly towards Chester Yard, when suddenly a large snake, probably a brown, gives Camilla a massive shock as she passes very close to it. We follow the markers across the road into snow-covered tracks up towards King Billy too. Currently climbing up Mount Magdala, getting close to the top. The drive to summit this peak is fueled by adrenaline. A very successful day, hard work. Here's uh, Karen and my daughter Camilla. So proud of them. And there's the crosscut saw right behind Camilla. So it gives us hope that we can go on and make Hotham. After that, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Because we're all pretty wrecked. We stop at an opening between two large rock faces named Hell's Window. Suddenly heaps of snow appears out of nowhere. The high plains leading to Mount Howard are completely snow covered. Yes, yes, straight ahead you can see Crossing over the summit of Mount Howard to open grassy plains is a relief now. We set up camp in windy, dark and freezing conditions. Karen runs over and announces that we have thousands of guests for dinner in the form of wolf spiders. Camilla immediately slides back into her tent and zips it completely closed. Not long after, I find one climbing on my leg and another 
in the tufty grass with its eyes glowing in my torchlight. We endure perhaps the most extremely windy night of any thus far. We wonder whether our tents will rip apart or blow over the mountain ridge just to our south. We have done really well today, catching up on three hours behind. Karen's chest infection, despite using Camilla's antibiotics, has not improved and her voice now reduced to a tiny squeak. Both Camilla and Karen need a very, very, very good sleep. This Australian Alpine walking track is about to enter the Razor Viking Wilderness. There will be no signs or directional markers to indicate the Australian Alpine walking track for a distance of 20 kilometres. Please be prepared for remote area navigation. So I hope you know where you're going, Trevor. Using my phone camera in the rain could lead to disaster in relation to malfunction as I have experienced on other trips. That's how I've kept it turned off most of the time. Thus there is little footage of this section. Camilla and Karen will see nothing much more than dense cloud and the track immediately below our feet. Everything is soaked and slippery. Camilla walks ahead, Karen in the middle and I behind watching every move. Am I worried? Yes, absolutely. As well as strong gusty winds, it's so cold. What they can't see are the many steep drop-offs and slippery slopes along the high peaks of the crosscut saw. As we summit speculation, 1,668 metres, there is hardly a word spoken. Nothing to see but cloud and no view of the middle campground where we will stop for lunch. A shame, as this is one of the grandest peaks in Victoria. We continue at a good pace along an old, very rough riverbed, eventually arriving at Catherine's Saddle at the base of Mount Despair. Yeah, yeah so it has been very raining. Very cold and we've had, had ropes help us get up cliff faces and yeah. all sorts of interesting yeah. experiences and danger today. Mount Despair, was it? Mount Despair, yeah. Yep, so we're going up Mount Despair. Trevor says it's a bit like going up a thousand steps, but I'm assuming there won't be steps. The rain has eased with a few breaks here and there. We are well and truly soaked, but warm enough whilst moving, freezing while stopped. We should arrive at the Viking Saddle in just three hours. Friends of mine had warned me not to climb across the Razor Viking in wet or bad weather conditions. Day turned into night. Continued searching for markers in the rain, the cold and the dark is causing us grief. There are slippery, soaked and very mossy rock faces. The foot tracks are hard to follow and many times we are forced to backtrack having followed animal tracks. I do not know what happened to the next two hours. Suddenly it was 11pm. We are freezing cold as we pause, stop and start, try again, take a wrong turn and then yes, we find a marker which leads us up a rock face to a ledge beyond our view. It is so wet and slippery up here with some decent drop offs if we slip. I begin to think to myself, how have I let ourselves get into this predicament? Karen, in her faint voice, says, I climbed across and over the ridge, but can't see any further or any markers. I think of Camilla, her husband Kyle and their son Lachlan, and Karen's family. If someone slips, how will we contact emergency services? Our mobile phones are useless here, and now the satellite phone seems inoperable. It is time to make some tough decisions. Camilla and Karen are willing to persist and do not want to turn back. They are very cold, wet and exhausted. We have been on the move for over 16 hours. If we continue tonight, there are several factors to consider which could spell disaster, including hypothermia and injury or worse. The answer instantly becomes clear in my mind. Overwhelmingly, I see that the health of Camilla and Karen is a thousand times more important than our personal pride. I will no longer risk any injury or worse or anyone's health in any way just across a mountain. We will try to backtrack a few kilometres to a location suitable to camp for the night. We make numerous attempts but continually hit dead ends. It is now 1am. I scan the trail around us to find a location wide enough to pig out at least one tent. Here it is, but it's on quite an angle. It's a ridiculous tent site, but the main objective is to get everyone out of their wet clothes, dried and in a warm sleeping bag. 
Hopefully we can get to sleep, but that's a secondary objective. We pitch Camilla's tent on an awkward angle. It's just usable. Then I ambitiously try to squeeze my tent next to that for Karen. It doesn't really fit, but do get it up after a fashion. It must be nearly 2am by the time we say goodnight. We try to figure out a way of staying in position rather than sliding into the tent wall. The bottom of Camilla's sleeping bag has absorbed a decent amount of water, but she manages. What a night, what a nightmare. We had a bad night last night. Didn't get into this slopey spot in uh, desperate relief from uh, climbing and getting lost till about one o'clock, totally soaked. All of these rock faces and some we have to climb are very wet and slippery and dangerous. We had a few hours sleep. So the next morning still in cloud, we pack up the soaked tents, gather our gear and chat about the possibility of finding our way out without trouble. I'm tremendously relieved that everyone is safe and sound. I feel totally responsible for Karen and Camilla and for a while had visions of something bad happening. We do not have sufficient spare food and water to remain here for an additional day or two to allow the rocks to dry out a little. Karen's chest infection is worrying me terribly and Camilla must get back to work promptly. It is with a very heavy heart and some anxiety but enormous relief that all are safe that I declare we shall return to speculation. I feel certain that this is the right decision. In a few days we will be back on the trail and will finish the Viking leg on our return from Canberra in three weeks. The fact that we have arranged for other family and friends to join us on specific dates in various difficult to get to locations is another complication. We already have one full day to make up. Camilla has successfully completed her scheduled eight days with almost 8,000 metres climb. Has been an inspiration and strength to me. Led us up many long and steep climbs and helped me tremendously back at Black River. We thank our very kind friends Nigel and Annie who gave us a very long ride all the way along Speculation Road and beyond to Mansfield and for my darling wife who picked us up from there. Karen has done extremely well with such a chest infection and must get to a doctor. Thank you Camilla, you are a legend. Camilla will shortly be back at work. We will repack, then back on the trail in a few days. Note, this leg was completed on our return from Canberra. However, we will leave it in trail sequence as to not confuse our viewers. Karen was unable to join us due to work, fire season commitments with Parks Victoria, but will also have completed this section before you view this footage. Thus we have covered every inch of the journey and much more. Hiking back into the Razor Viking has been a major accomplishment of its own. We backtrack to the foot of Mount Despair, retracing the troubled stormy rock faces. It looked terrifying at that time, but right now it doesn't look so bad at all. Certainly a big cliff face down that way. And this is probably where Karen was, thinking that she could see nothing else beyond. And actually, we weren't very far from the trail that leads to the Viking Saddle. On the other hand, I would have anguished much more deeply if someone had fallen or Karen had ended up with pneumonia. Marker. Yes, yes, yes. Apart from the fallen trees, the trail to the Viking Saddle is most pleasant and easy to follow despite the scary notes in the good book. Probably 15 or, whoa, 15 or 20 logs um, on the trail. Climb over, Viking saddle. And wow, there is the Viking. That is a massive, massive steep climb from here. From Viking Saddle, which is an excellent campsite, but no water, but plenty of wasps, we continue up the most imposing Viking, which overshadows the saddle as it increases in gradient as we approach the scary rock cliffs above. Up to the rock faces, the rock cliffs. And somewhere in there is the chimney. So, as you can see, this is the chimney 
and you've got to climb up through those rocks using that rope. The chimney is not so dangerous, but if you slipped or the rope broke, then ouch, that could be bad. That's the chimney from the top. And that is where we've come from. Magnificent. On our way to the summit, we see three snakes, which Mick announces as alpine copperheads. I step right over the top of one with gaiters on. As I step so close to its head, it hardly moves. No doubt it would strike if stepped on. It is incredibly rewarding to be standing here, but perhaps no harder than any other climbs over the last few weeks. Trevor and I have just walked up the Viking. It's roughly seven o'clock now, or seven p.m. Uh, we've climbed up to about 1,530 metres. Uh, it's been a pretty tough climb. We're both <laughs> pretty well knackered at the moment. What a beautiful place. It's so satisfying to have climbed to this point. And from here, we're gonna go down this ridge line and head out to Harry Shepherd's track for the next leg of uh, the walk, which heads out towards Mount Selwyn and Mount Murray. We begin the 900 metre descent towards Barry Saddle and then Harry Shepherd's track. Descending is a scramble and often so steep and rocky that at times it's dangerous. And we've only done one and a half kilometres of the 10 kilometres required to get to Harry Shepherd Road. So, and we're not down the mountain the steep wall. I fall directly onto a jagged rock which grazes and bruises my thigh, taking the skin off my elbow. We're about halfway down the mountain, down the northern side of the Viking, and seriously, it is a scramble, a mad scramble. Elevation 1017 meters. So now we're um, well and truly off the Viking and uh, heading towards um, Barry Saddle. Yeah, I was amazed. But yeah, they classed us as, you know, as industrial athletes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, just because of all the gear that we carry. Hey, look. Oh, the water. There's, oh, that's there's the a Barry Saddle. Madden's water, oh, Barry Saddle water tank, yeah. Yeah. Hey, enough? what's it like? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's man. Full. It's full. Beautiful. It's full of wigglies, too. Yeah. We've actually hiked 20k since 3pm, climbed over 1,000 metres and descended a long, steep, scrambling Viking. Mick's generous commitment to get me into this remote Viking area, a difficult trip, is now complete. Thank you, Mick. So I really appreciate uh, Mick coming out and uh, setting me up here and coming up to the Viking with me. Thank you, Trevor, for allowing me to come along on this um, expedition, as I'll call it. Tough, it but good. It was a tough so, day. So thanks yeah. for allowing me to join you on that, that leg there. It was great. great. Journey continues and we're on the way to Selwyn and then Hotham. Had a good sleep from midnight to 6.30 a.m. It's over 3,000 metres climb to Hotham from here. So this is Selwyn Track, just 15 minutes from the campsite at Harry Shepherd's uh, track. Always searching for the next step. And if it doesn't get any thicker, I should be able to find my way through. There's another nice snake. That's a bigger one and that looks like a copperhead also. I move along to Mount Selwyn swiftly, feeling a little fatigued from yesterday's big climb with Mick. This is the location of the Barry Mountains water tank. The water tank is in disrepair. Thank you to Parks and Helpers. Much appreciated. I've done about 10 today so far. Mount Selwyn track? Yes. Climbing to the top of uh, Mount Selwyn from the south side has been uh, really tough. <coughs> and there's a storm brewing. 9.30 p.m. I'm relaxing in my sleeping bag and the winds are picking up. Mick Renshaw rings to warn me of a nasty lightning storm which has just passed through Buffalo. Tent lights up like a Christmas tree as lightning strikes and thunder follows. The 
tries to blow me off the edge just a few metres away. I lean heavily against the tent walls as well as grip the material with my hands. I pile all of my gear against the wind driven side to help negate the direct pressure. The tent ceiling and walls are buckling over and down threatening to collapse completely. I can't believe the tent is still standing and is not ripped to shreds. So tired, must sleep. 1am. The storm continues. Lightning and thunder has awoken me again, but the direct wind force is not as severe this time. I again lean heavily against the tent wall, and in less than an hour, all is calm again. The bottom of the sleeping bag is now quite wet, but not a real problem. 6.30 a.m. Always wanted to camp on Selwyn. At the time, it was dramatic, but now just a great memory. Fantastic day it was. Good climb and distance. Twenty metres to the north is a memorial plaque in remembrance of a man who went off hunting in this location and was never seen again. 24 years old. This is the plaque we come to remember, our best friend we lost in November. Bernie and Linda's son, Shana's sibling, Maddie's lover and our brother. Rest in peace, young friend. Cut him loose, let him run. The trail leads steeply down a poorly defined foot track to the northeast. The foliage is often overgrown and soaked here. from the night storm and morning here. rain. My clothes, hiking boots and socks are now soaked, but not a problem. Pressing forward along the crest of the Great Dividing Range is quite easy and satisfying. I'll really push it today. I've carried 5.5 litres of water for the day's journey, so no need to search for water through this section of the notoriously dry Barry Mountains. Arriving at the track leading to the Twins, I feel quite exhausted having now completed almost 30 kilometres at a very good pace. It does look very steep from the bottom. I'm not sure whether it was the splendid views all around or the relief of reaching the summit of the last challenge for the day that will for many years remain a moment of deep satisfaction in my mind. Whoops, I walked the wrong way. I walked um, down that crest, that's northwest. I should have walked northeast. There must be Mount St Bernard straight ahead and Hotham. Yep, that'll be Hotham right at the top. The northeast descent is seriously steep though and highlights every sore toe, ankle, knee, and hip joint. Do not take this route if you have bad knees. Well, that was a massive descent from the twins very steep and uh, a real knee crusher. So it looks like Barry Saddle to the Great Alpine Highway at Mount St Bernard is achievable in two days. Crossing the Twins is inspiring and satisfying, a highlight of the entire journey. 34 recorded GPS kilometres and almost 2,000 metres climb. Very successful and satisfying day. Tough, absolutely. Three p.m. The journey continues. Uphill start to Hotham. A little testy in the heat, with enough flies to feed a dinosaur. At five kilometres per hour, it's turning out to be a tougher walk than expected. Viewing the razor towards Feathertop is always stunning and I'm tempted to turn off and take this route past Federation Hut, but no, I'll continue on. Less than two hours later, I pass the highest transport point on Australian soil, the Cross, 1,845 metres, the highest coach road in Australia. On the way, moving a good pace, suddenly see Derek Hut. I must have a look inside but won't rest here, must quickly continue on. I tap on the door with my poles to ensure that I do not startle any unassuming traveller at rest. Walk in, 
and started oh. who is exhausted and resting after a massive 40 kilometre day. She has hiked through the mountains, including some sections of the Australian Alps walking track for around 19 days on her own. Approaching Dippin's hut, the trail descends more steeply and is covered with loose rocky material. And over here, we have Dibbins hut. During the night, I hear noises inside the hut. In the morning, I find that some bush rats have done their own investigation and have had a party with a few packets of nuts, two get up and goes, and a few other items. Since the 18.8k was mostly on sealed road to Mount Locke and then predominantly downhill thereafter, the GPS tells me that it took less than four hours, moving time that is. It was a really easy evening's hike. After finding the trail from Dibbins Hut across Kobunga River, I follow the river downstream for a short distance, then climb steeply past Kobunga Gap and Basalt Temple. Roper Hut, we're heading for at the end of the day. It'll be about eight hours walk. Once passing the tree-lined rim of the Bogong High Plains, I am thrilled by the many miles of beautiful, expansive, flat high plains, which extend all the way past Cope Saddle to Falls Creek. Cope Saddle Hut, is actually a refuge built originally as part of the operations for the hydro electric scheme. Just past the Falls Creek Bogong High Plains Road, I discover Cope Hut, which is impressive and obviously well used. The five kilometre track along the aqueduct is the easiest section of the Australian Ups walking track since leaving Walhalla and spirits are high, arriving at Langford Gap in less than an hour. Thank you to the three ladies on bicycles who helped me search for the battery charger. Better start watching out for snakes again. Another climb and then a delightful mountain top paradise with views of majestic valleys and mountains all round. 34 kilometres after leaving Dibbon's hut, and Roper Hut is just around the corner. Thank goodness I've had enough for today. This is a beautiful place. I could stay here for a week. Wow, what a beautiful hut. Very impressed. It looks like we have company. I asked the family about their decision to go remote together. I'm Peter and uh, this is my wife Megan and Chloe and Lachlan. This is uh, our biggest overnight hike to date. So we're out for four nights this, on this hike. Well, there's a toilet, so it's, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could, be, could be rougher. I like whittling away at sticks. It's fun. Yeah. To make like lightsaber handles. It's good. We get lots of yummy food that we don't usually eat. It's great to, to be physically tired and have many hours just to slowly cook a meal and read and play cards. And uh, cards! <laughs> and just um, cope with the elements. And so just spending some solid time together is really good family bonding time I think. I'm tired and in the tent now. I love my tent. It represents relief from the strains of many hours of hiking and all I have to do is write my journal, cook dinner, listen to music, audio books and importantly read a few chapters. Not the toughest day but tough Close enough. Door, Fall to sleep quickly. Six a.m. The sun is rising through the snow gums at Roper Hut. I'm up early, excited by the possibility of making it to Matt Will's hut. If I get cracking, I spring into action, have breakfast, stretch out some muscles, pack up the tent and gear, and I'm on the trail and over the edge by seven a.m. Could be exciting. Apparently, the chain bridge. We'll see. The descent to Big River is long, steep and sometimes dangerously slippery, but at the same time satisfying as I travel quickly. 740 metres descent, over 2.5 kilometres, very jarring walking. I don the water shoes and use the chain just for fun. Would have more fun if the water was a metre higher. It's time to climb straight back up with a suggested climbing time of 2.5 hours to Madison's hut site. I try to guess each 100 metres ascent starting from the river at an elevation of 1,000 metres. I go hard and I'm loving it, nice and sweaty, occasionally with burning legs and heavy breathing. That was a tough climb, and now have a good break and lunch, 
at the most unexpected and welcome stream with a lovely grassed area which appears out of nowhere just around the corner from Madison's hut site and the turn off to either Mount Bogong or the Long Spur. The Long Spur is well named going on and on and on, eventually descending way down to Big River Saddle. So I'm hoping to get down to Big River Saddle um, by four o'clock. I'm tired now and tempted to stay at Big River Saddle, but after a 15 minute rest, seeing that the sun is very high, I then look at Mount Wills to my north, 1,757 metres, which is a 570 metre climb. The steepness is savage, my heart pounds more distinctly than normal. I'm struggling and begin a chant. The first words which come to mind are one step, one step, one step at a time. You have no idea how relieved I am to see this hut. It's been one of the tough days. I've uh, started at seven this morning Wow, that is nice. It's a beautiful place. 32 kilometers with 1,700 meters ascent and some of that very steep. I'll leave Mount Wills at 8 a.m. and follow a pleasant foot track down and across a saddle to Mount Wills South the foot track south of Mount Wills does become a little indistinct initially and I lose it for a time. Then down, 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 630 metres descent to Sunnyside and along Omeo Highway to the Australian Alps, walking track, Gill Spur track. Leaving Mount Wills at 8am, I arrive at the highway at 10.05. Scott and Shane Bulfin, along with Karen and I, continue from here to Gill Creek as per day 18. So here we have um, Shane and Scott joining Karen and myself. So we're going to walk down this spur here to Gill Creek Grin and up the, the other side um, on 8 mile loop track and then 4 mile Starting track. at 1 p.m. from Omeo Highway we descend 555 metres to Gill Creek, a very pleasant track with just a little pushing of scrub from side to side. We see a number of snakes including a large tiger. Karen and Scott had stepped right next to it without realising. Yeah, no, they're a piece. Oh, come on. They're an ADP. They come in many different sizes. But... Crossing the creek is awkward and takes a few minutes of preparation and consideration. Everyone ended up with one wet foot. However, Karen hit her head quite hard on an overhanging tree branch, naturally looking Coming down through. rather than up. The branch was up. The climb of 560 metres from the creek to the crest at Wombat Divide Track is quite challenging, especially as Scott is boring ahead at a million miles an hour. It is 16.24, so we've got about two to three hours of sunlight left and we are going to absolutely hoon. It's like man. 50 metres or so. But this is definitely the coolest orchid I have seen in my life. Oh, come on. OK, do you love that? I do. Do you think I should pick it and give it to Kim? Oh, come on. We then descend steeply 820 metres to the Midamida River at Taylor's Crossing. Yeah. <laughs> you look like Moses a bit too, the white hair. 66. Well, that's a good, that's a good number. This is a most impressive suspension bridge and the third to be built here. The other two washed away under high water. The Midamida River is the largest river along the whole Australian Alps walking track and represents the lowest geographical location on the entire journey at just under 500 metres. Shane lit a campfire and we had mixed baked beans with little sausages for dinner. A great day's hike all in an afternoon and now 14 kilometres ahead of the original schedule. Crossing the formidable Midamida River at Taylor's Crossing is another milestone. Karen is a great hiker, but today's daunting challenge with heavy packs is troubling her. 1,500 metres, we can do it. We can do it. Here we have some kangaroos strung up. Um, infestation problem and they're just hanging them up dry to get rid of them. Scott's feeling quite hungry. 
Look at that breakfast. Pick up a snack. No, Scott. No, mate. No, no, no. They've oh. been there a bit long. Good afternoon. We are here at a gorgeous lookout today, looking down at Morass Creek. Now, we have almost done 10 k's already today. Probably got about 16 or so more to do and a lot of uphill. The descent is sudden and steep towards Morass Creek. Once again, the river shoes are used by all as we cross the creek, trying not to sink into a muddy swamp on the south side. It's an easy crossing. As the hours pass by, at the pace we're moving, I'm feeling very uncertain about reaching Johnny's top before nightfall. It really depends on the track conditions and our energy. And then we've uh, basically climbed for the last 15 k's, up some nice ridges, um, spurs, and here we are at Johnny's track. <coughs> Can stop coughing or like just die there please? <laughs> Karen also has her doubts regarding today's climb. She writes, quote, I feel that I wasn't going to make it as I was struggling to keep up and felt defeated. I was tired from trying to keep up the day before and my feet hurt from my Morton's neuromas, blisters, and I had woken up with a bruised left ankle and a rash on both legs. I also had a sore head from it being bruised from the previous day. By the end of the day, the pain of my feet was a background pain as it was overridden by hip pain. I ended up using a Chuck Super Wipe to cushion my hip for the rest of the hike. End of quote. But before we know, <laughs> darkness has surrounded us and head torches come out. A little rain begins to fall. This has been another significant milestone and we are so grateful for our food and water, warmth, protection within our tents and for each other. We mention all of this as we give thanks for our meal, which was cooked and enjoyed after dark with freezing fingers. Karen, that was a fantastic effort. Well done. I'm going to admit this is actually for me the hardest to have had for the whole trip. Happy birthday, Karen. Thank you, I turned 29. 29? Yep. You jumped from 27 to 29 in one year, that's amazing. Scott has prepared a hot chocolate for Karen and we sing her happy birthday. Happy birthday, it's Karen's birthday today. Do you know that one? <laughs> older than yesterday. <laughs> Everybody shout hip hip hooray <laughs> and we'll all sing happy birthday. I've Happy never heard that. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Karen. And um, a great, beautiful setting amongst the uh, the snow gums and the alpine grass. And, and really significant for me is that we made it here to Johnny's Top because there was some doubt. We had a long way to come and a huge climb. We were at the Uenba hut site, which um, there's actually no hut here. There's it was an old hot site, we've walked five hours and we're just about to head off. Finding our way through this section, through the farm fencing to the poplars was frustrating, causing a little anxiety. Patience with each other was not flourishing, but we got there. It's all part of the journey. Karen is usually ahead as I muck around taking video, making quick toilet stops or stretching, then catching up again. Well, it looks like we're heading that way, are we? Buckwong Track. Eventually we arrive at Buckwong Creek Hut, arriving at 7.25 p.m. Sadly, pressing necessities and sore knees prevented Scott from completing his seven days to Dead Horse Gap. Thank you, Scott and Shane. Now at 22.30 hours, I'm laying in my bag, keeping warm, having written notes for the day. Once again, fingers are freezing. Another big day's work, not so challenging as earlier days as the terrain is now much more friendly. More bush bashing and a surprisingly impressive Dead Horse Creek. This morning Karen reports her night's observations which is something like, During the night some brumbies walked into our campsite, sniffing and pressing their noses onto my tent, prancing around and stomping up and down the creek. They didn't leave in a hurry while dogs were howling through the night in the distance. It rained and blew a gale between 2 and 3 a.m. and I hardly slept, end quote. Whereas I didn't hear a thing apart from the howl of the wild dogs before going to sleep. I'm a little bit tired. The um, wild horses actually kept me up last night. With the little sleep that Karen is having, I do not know how she is coping. 
She is redefining the words endurance, recovery and resilience. Gold, a eureka. Uh, big, massive quartz rock. So I'm sure there's gold in that. But um, fortunately, carrying lightweight, I don't have the gold mining tools. So sorry, Mum. Next time. And very much enjoyed passing through Dead Horse Creek, which did prove to have the most beautiful flowing water, more like a river than a creek. During the day, a little more frustration and tiredness opens the door for a few arguments. The poorly defined foot track leading towards Davies Plain Ridge eludes us from about four kilometres from the summit. We are rushing our navigational decisions a little without properly checking. Easy to do when we're trying to cover long distances at a good pace. Suddenly we see people, other people, about 300 metres to our west. We scramble through scrub towards their position and are now back on the Australian Alps walking track and walk hard and fast all day, arriving at Limestone Creek at 5.45 p.m. We decide to stay and quickly light a campfire, wash some clothes in the river, have a cup of soup and dry a few clothes by our big fire. Karen's turn to, um, to walk the plank. Beginning at Limestone Creek track, a nice easy stroll, we soon turn off along Stones Creek. About six kilometres later, we begin climbing a long, steepish ridge line on a poorly defined track which leads to Cowanbat track. We climbed well. It was fun, wasn't it? Tomorrow morning, we should be passing the border. And this track is just a pleasure to walk on. We can pick up a bit of pace. Passing by a recently burnt out section of bush, we suddenly smell that unforgettable and strong but not unpleasant burnt odour. The dozers actually had to walk in for, into this area from probably about four or five k's or so up the road, maybe even more, which was surprising. They obviously couldn't get the, the float in. However, the action is all over and only the big bulldozer tracks and burnt material evident. Crossing Pilot Creek brings a smile as we realise that we are almost there, just over the next rise and around the corner. The campsite location is perfect, so much more friendly than some of the harsh environments camped in with Camilla and Karen weeks ago. How impressive is this, an expansive cleared grassland descending gently towards the tiny Murray River and Victoria and New South Wales border, a perfect camping ground with some brumbies further down in the valley. An inspection of the plane wreck is a must, but Karen, with enough curiosity to kill a cat, jogs down one kilometre to the state border to check the signs. This is very exciting and highly motivating. We are getting there. The expansive Kosciuszko National Park. The sun shines early on our tents from the east. We feel somewhat rejuvenated and are delighted with this wonderful place. Karen gives an account of wind strength at various hours of the night. Down there is the uh, border of New South Wales and Victoria. Be crossing that shortly, which will be fantastic. Um, at a wreckage of an old aircraft that crashed in 1953. It is a RAF C-47 Dakota. Um, unfortunately, one of the crew members actually died. This is another piece of the aircraft. Uh, this one seems to be the most popular for graffiti. Cameron loves somebody, loves Ellie in 98. Jay Hicks, the 13th of the 3rd, 1978. He's clearly the oh, cockpit. Yeah. yeah. Each day we give thanks for our food and other things for which we are so grateful. Since day one with Kylie, we set this pattern voluntarily, taking turns to give thanks in our own way. It's Karen's turn today. Believe me, we are incredibly grateful for every drop of water and every portion of food received, and for every other comfort available as we trek forth in a journey of distance against time, blisters and aches and pains, the pleasures of nature against fatigue with little more than basic survival items. We are subject to changeable weather conditions more than others would realise, unless they have lived in the mountains for a time. This is a very significant moment for us. And I have just crossed the Murray River into New South Wales and Karen is about to do so. Be fine. We're 
we're very mindful of the Kathy Freeman Foundation and the great work that they do and our opportunity to support them. So um, we would like to express our appreciation to every single person who has contributed to the cause, um, whether through uh, donations to the Foundation or through supporting us in one way or the other. The source of the Murray is upstream just a few kilometres. We see in the distance an approach from adult brumbies with their very young foal. As we draw near, they run in fright, leaving the foal exposed to danger. That's us. Most unusual, as we draw closer to the foal, the adults watch from a distance, unsure what to do. I continue forward with the camera, rolling while Karen chooses to remain back a little in a safe position. As I approach the foal, one of the adults begins stomping back towards me. Karen shouts, Watch out Trevor, it's coming. I continue filming, now with an increased pulse, sensing an opportunity to capture great footage with a little risk. However, so quickly, the adult stops, stomps a little more and turns back, running further away. Arriving early at Tin Mine Hut has allowed us to search for water, light a fire and settle in for a big day tomorrow. Tin mine huts and cascade huts, thread by river and a critical food drop. We're leaving at 7.45am. We have given ourselves the best chance to make thread bow before dark. The days of climbing over 1,000 metres a day seem pretty much over. However, today's climb is a total of 1,040 metres. We stop for lunch at Cascades Hut, which I particularly liked, and soon continue on to Dead Horse Gap. It was built in 1935 or 1938. They're not quite sure who built it. There's a long list of names with um, Tom Grogan being one of them. Well, Karen, kind of looks like we've got the Cascades Creek or river here. Fortunately, there's a little footbridge over it. Yeah, it's a little mm. bit too cold for a wash though, otherwise I would have loved a wash. We've just taken a small break here to look at um, what looks to be the snow that is still on. So I'm moving along fast, generally five to six kilometres per hour. From our tents, we have a wonderful view before us of Australia's highest peak, Mount Kosciuszko. We cook up a meal in the dark as the temperature plummets. Within minutes, not a soul is seen. Head torches are turned off. Writing the blog is difficult though, as fingers and noses freeze up fast when laying still. The elevation here is 1500 metres. During the night, the tents began icing up. A number of times I bashed the tent walls to remove the ice and snow. He gave me a road to choose. He gave me freedom. And I pray I'm strong enough to walk in his shoes. And I, I hope that this morning I woke up around 4 a.m. and was absolutely freezing. Getting out of the tent to empty the bladder is unpleasant, of course so you hang on as long as you possibly can, until there's no choice. So out I go at 5am, only to see the entire valley covered in white. I know that Karen has been very cold and has not slept well. We cross the Threadbow River for the second and last time at that location and walk two kilometres to the food drop. Is that bad planning? Loading up and carrying a full pack up and over Australia's highest peak. Victoria. Wow. Magnificent. To our wow. surprise, Sam has arrived the previous evening. He has ridden his bike fully laden with his full pack and heaps of fresh food for us, while his derailleur was stuck in a very low gear all the way from Jindabyne through Threadbow, past this position and up a big hill where we hit his bike. Well done, Two packs on the front. Balance, balance the weights. Balance the weight. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Does it do that? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, it's actually really good. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. We don't stop to eat, we have to nibble on the way and I'm really bad at that. You don't stop to eat? No, we're not allowed to stop to eat. Where are we now? Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for a third person to come along. <laughs> a good 700 metres ascent, but gradual with many surprises including snow, large rock formations and beautiful views. There are numerous ways of traversing the snow-covered slopes. <laughs> 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 
melting snows are filling the mountain streams with abundant pure water. Karen, have you seen Sam? I ask. As it turns out, Sam has taken the heavily snow-covered route across the high peaks. Probably climbed up that frozen waterfall over there, and he's probably up there already. Wouldn't want to slip down there. It is a proud and significant moment as we reach the summit of Australia's highest peak. Our intention is to head northeast through Mueller's Pass, Carruthers Peak, Mount Anton, onto White's River Hut. However, we are warned not to venture that way as the snow bridges over rivers are melting the danger being falling through into the fast flowing streams, thus we are taking a longer route. In bitterly cold winds, we await for Sam at Rawson's Pass. He arrives looking exhausted and explains that his attempt to cross the high peaks to Kosciuszko summit had been too difficult in deep snow and ended up summiting an alternate high peak before returning along our route. Just three kilometres past Charlotte's Pass, we find a creek and suitable area to camp for the night with two picnic tables and merging creeks, Spencer's and Betts. Once again, the setting sun opens the floodgates of freezing winds. Tents are up, dinner's cooked, and three hikers scramble into their tents, not to be seen or heard again that night. Beautiful sunshine to warm our bodies after a freezing cold night. Following an incredibly cold night, with Karen in particular suffering from cold legs for many hours, we arise to find our tents once again covered in ice. Um, woke up this morning and there's literally an icicle about one centimetre hanging from my tent. Um, from the inside of my tent that is and we depart in beautiful sunshine heading towards Perisher Valley where surprisingly we discover phone reception. Leaving Perisher we turn left on Link Road eventually leading us through the middle of the snowy river hydroelectric plant and then up a steep aqueduct track. Whilst walking through the plant a contractor tells us that we are trespassing. He even gives us directions which Sam and Karen quickly determine as incorrect. The aqueduct takes us up past Mount Disappointment and the hut. The hut is actually quite nice, it's not a disappointment. Sam falls to sleep briefly while resting in the little hut. She wants to take it home but we said no you can't do that because you've got nowhere to put it at your house otherwise you no. could have it. We continue on to White's River Hut and absolutely love everything about it. Karen investigates some kind of communications infrastructure adjacent to the hut. A scream echoes through the valley and Karen bolts from the scene of what is thought to be a man eating copperhead. <coughs> the last 3.3 kilometres for the day seems to take forever. We're tired and are starting to think we've missed it we first see the impressive toilet and to its left a large terrific hut with a substantial stream close by with plenty of firewood. The temperature has already plummeted. Rain and hail forecast for the night and morning. We venture out into bitterly cold and hostile weather. Rain and hail pelted our cold bodies. Pockets of hail gather on the ground. It's difficult to operate the phone camera touch screen with wet and freezing fingers. It's hailing right now. My left big toe feels like it's developing a stress fracture. Karen's having ter terrible trouble with her hands. Well, it's a bit cold and I can't feel my hands and they throb. And I've decided I'd like to cut them off because they're so cold and hurtful. Um, but I think I might need them in the future. Okay, so you got any ideas what you can do? Well, I've got my gloves that I need for sleeping and I'm going to try and get... Melting snow has obviously increased the number and size of the river crossings. We're 
where Sam usually leaps from rock to rock, often avoiding getting wet feet or changing into river shoes at all. Well, the moment I saw it and I saw Sam actually cross first and I saw what he did, I thought, no, I can't do that, I'll slip and smash my face like um, Trevor did a couple of weeks ago. I admit I got a little bit anxious. I went to actually cross it and then I thought, no, nah, what if I slip? So I went back, I got Trevor. Actually going a lot faster than I thought. Good work, Karen. Well done, keep going, Karen. Get right out of it. We were soaked through and the temperature's been really cold. So if it was a normal day, we would have gone, ah, oh, yeah, just go. But because it was so cold, yeah. It was different. Uh, wow. Wow, oh, you're kidding. Yes. No way. No. I seriously wouldn't do this one, Sam. I know you wouldn't. That is way too far to jump. He skips across a few boulders, places his takeoff foot down, which slipped a little. I panicked, quickly lowering the camera and completely missed filming one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. After slipping, he hovered over the gushing water, landing on the front edge of the far boulder. Talk about giving the old man a heart attack. Sam is fighting on, despite feeling quite ill from the chest infection and enduring pain from his knees and a number of blisters. I still do not have one blister after so many miles on so many rough tracks. I can only attribute it to the right socks, which I've worn every day from Walhalla. We approach O'Keefe's hut, ready to collapse on the floor. Approximately 10 men, all university acquaintances, have gathered to celebrate life together in the wilderness. They offer us the back room of the hut, but we thank them and are happy to pitch our tents. And um, we've got a lovely um, sunset here. Karen's tent rips out of the ground and Sam meets a big brown. And it is a beautiful morning and as you can see Karen's holding my water container with ice caked across the top of it and that's how our tents have been. The sun is our friend warming our bodies quickly as we head off some 25 kilometres towards Happy Jacks Road, Happy Jacks Valley and eventually the Happy Jacks Trail intersection not far from Happy's Hut. We are still in Kosciuszko National Park, the jungle wilderness, as we pass by Farm Ridge Hut site and Mackay's Hut along the Greymare Trail. How you going, Sam? Pretty tired. Yeah. Yeah. We all are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, knees. Sore knees. Yeah. Neurofen. Lots of neurofen. Yeah. Lots of it. Yeah. Yeah. We're happy to get there. We've had four big yes. days. Here we have. We have really days. big days, bigger than expected. This is Happy Jack's Road. Sam steps close to a big brown near Dr. Phillips hut site, which we could not locate with any certainty. I'm afraid Dr. Phillips, we can't see your hut site. Greymare Trail goes on and on and on. We finally arrive at our destination. Happy Jack's Trail. This is a serious relief for Sam as his knees are causing him constant pain. He can hardly take another step. Karen was given the first choice of suitable sites and chose the one which was flat, just by the sign and partially over an old gravel road. On completion, I said, Karen, the pegs are pretty secure. Unless a hurricane hits, you'll be fine. Within a minute, a powerful whirly whirly appears out of nowhere. I struggle to hold my tent down, some of the pegs lifting a little, and Sam wrestles with his, as Karen's rips out of the ground completely, throwing a number of tent pegs metres over the tent into the scrub. It's been a terrific four days, every day pretty tough. Climbed over Kosciuszko, crossed many time-consuming rivers, caught up to schedule, having chosen the longer route due to melting snow bridges, endured a little pain and experienced the coldest day of the journey thus far. Pete joins the team and we say goodbye to Sam, Rochelle, Lenny and Arno. I'd like to welcome you Arno 
Nice to see you, buddy. And Lenny, isn't she beautiful? Peter and Rochelle arrive with Lenny and Anna around 10.15 a.m. after solving the mystery of the wrong meeting place location. <laughs> Slam dunk. Hey, enjoy it. I want to get it. Um, and hope you get some sleep, because I won't. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rochelle, and thank you, Park Rangers. Bye, Dada. Bye, Granddad. Bye, Karen. I'm grateful that Sam, as my eldest son, has uh, been able to join us and, um, and with uh, pretty ordinary knees, has done a fantastic job. This is our final leg, seven days to Thara. Heaps of Ks to go, but not as much climbing. We leave for Happy's Hut at 11.30 a.m. where we enjoy our established Sunday morning discussion. So far, we're bush bashing from Happy's Hut. So it says six hours in the book. I reckon we'll probably do it in four. Always got to start off with a hard one when you've got a new person to make sure that they're um, <laughs> yeah. inducted into the trip. <laughs> This very small bush hut, pretty cool. It is built in 1937. Looks inviting as we descend, passing the bush drop toilet on the way down from a small rise. There is so much history all around us. The building of these huts, the women and children who were part of this life, a life of survival with very few comforts. And it says Bob Hughes of Coyandra, who built Four Mile Hut in 1937 and that's him I'm guessing out here on the lovely horse with his lovely Trevor's hat. showing us how to use his arms instead of his legs this time and um Pete's doing the same 24 hours of rain is about to hit so we quickly cut wood light the large cylindrical pot belly stove and cook a great dinner once again the sleeping bags are pulled tightly over our faces leaving that little gap for breathing Four mile hut. Staying here for the day due to 24 hours of rain predicted. Better to stay dry. Pete and Karen are collecting more firewood whilst I catch up on the journal and sleep for a while like a lazy dog on the floor. It's a rugged hut built that way with many gaps through the walls and floor. However, most importantly, the roof is not leaking. So you think you can tell. The consequence of resting up for a day is that we now need to make up 25 kilometres at some point to catch up. Tomorrow morning we will venture out towards White's Hut by Kyandra. Six thirty AM, we're up and preparing for a solid day's hike. Thank you, Bob Hughes. Bye Bob Guy. There's a hut in the mountains where many call in, made of wood slabs and covered in kerosene tin. With character of plenty yet modest and neat, in a beautiful spot next to Four Mile Creek. So thank you, Bob Hughes, for the hut you built here. We came to work on it in autumn each year. To fill up the woodshed, do any repair so it's in good shape, all park users to share. So just to take a moment, if you happen to call, and thank Bob, whose photo is up on the wall. Walking down to Kyandra from the hills above is one of those rewarding moments, a significant milestone. The courthouse behind me was built as both a police station and a courthouse in 1890. We're on our way down to the river and the bridge where we will hopefully find our food drop. It's still there. <laughs> Kiandra Gold Rush. It was from 1859 to 1860, which 
kind of makes sense considering Bob, whose hut we stayed in last night, um, had a lay in mine and that didn't last very long either. The rush broke out after payable gold was discovered here in Pollock's Gully in November 1959. By March, April in 1860, there were more than 10,000 men. So we loaded up, a little bit heavier than before. Karen washed her hair down in the Kyandra River. A wedge tail eagle in the sky and we're all full of baked beans and chunky beef soup. Oh, chunky beef soup. We then continue through the rivers and onwards towards Wild Horse Plain and Wide's Hunt. <laughs> we see two groups of Brumbies galloping across the open fields. Hey, don't, don't scare them off, I want to get them closer. Not our toughest day and perhaps our earliest finish yet. Still 22 k's with 23 kilogram packs is a fair effort and the river crossings slow you down quite a bit. Quite a pleasant hut. White's hut is a single roomed replica of the original hut burnt down years ago. Tomorrow we have a record breaking 36 kilometres to tackle in order to get back on track. We are once again way behind schedule. Karen and Peter live first, then I sort a few items, don my pack and collect some water from a tiny creek 100 metres down the track. By this time, Peter and Karen are out of sight. I move quickly to catch them, however whilst listening to an audiobook, fail to concentrate and miss the northward turn at Bullock Hill Trail. After approximately 30 minutes of super fast marching, I cannot see them at all. I am now quite troubled. Ready to stop and reassess, I suddenly see them in the distance preparing to cross the Tantangara River. Serious relief and no damage done, but a lesson learned. Right, so now we're off for a little adventure, 10.30 I think. Our next challenge is to cross the Murrumbidgee River and then to find the less distinct foot track leading up five or six kilometres towards an old disused telephone line. There's a pole up, the transistors, a little bit of wiring still there. We're following this along for about four kilometres and then to Port Phillip Trail. We've done very well today. We're probably getting towards uh, 20k and heading for 35, 37. Long way to go yet. We have a number of river crossings and feel fatigued for the last few hours. However, make our distance by 6.30 p.m. And we finally arrive at the Bill Jones hut after at least 35 kilometers, which is our biggest day. So we don't know if we can get in, but we will shall shortly find out. Hmm, the condition of the hut is disappointing. No table, nowhere to sit, thus we eat outside in the cold. Setting up and getting into our tents happens really fast. We don't need a weather forecast to know that it's going to be very cold tonight. First steps into the Namaji National Park, ACT. Woke up this morning with um, ice underneath my tent again. I'm treating myself to two tablets today of electrolytes. We leave at 9.10am. A rather sluggish start to another long day. I'm a light sleeper so any noise wakes me up, um, which is a bit kind of unfortunate. Old Phil's hut suddenly appears, perfectly positioned in a green open field on our left. So much, we're heading down to the river where we're going to fill up our water bottles and uh, get on our way. We're just under halfway for the day. Sad to leave this wonderful place and we're soon on the move again, feeling fresh and nourished as we pass a number of great streams, including the Good Redigby River and Dunn's Flat Creek. Well, according to the sign, we are in Namaji National Park, which I believe means that we're no longer in New South Wales. We're actually in um, Australian <coughs> Capital Territory, ACT, yeah. Where I am still in New South Wales. Oh, yeah, Trevor's always like a state behind. Yeah. So.
Karen loves the downhill, she can skip down and catch up. On the other side of the hut is a beautiful, clean and fast running river, Cotter River. And without water, we would not get very far. No. I am tired and keen to stop now for the night, but Pete being determined that this place, Pond Creek, is a swampy mosquito and snake infested pit, walks straight on saying, we are not camping here, Dad. I thought that I was the boss, but I suppose from Karen's position, would you rather follow the young, muscular, handsome man or the old, ugly one? I am tired and annoyed as we had already completed over 30 kilometres for the day. We camped on the trail, like literally, which is actually I think the first time we've done that. Today was the second day of 36 k's, so my feet are quite sore. So it was a pretty horrendous day and I'm pretty wrecked. So I thought we were going to do 25, 26, and we ended up doing 36. We have um, classic beef curry to warm us up. Um, and then we'll have a butter chicken and a beef and pasta hot pot. So um, we are living a little bit of camping luxury. Before long, we're comfortable in our tents after a serious and contentious debate on whether we should leave at 9 a.m. or 9-ish a.m. Quite so, I've probably got about two or three blisters on each foot. Karen said goodnight to her friend, the sugar glider possum. We are doing extremely well. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, That'll... We're leaving Saltpit Creek on our way to Royal, Royal River and uh, final destination, um, Honeysuckle Creek. Peter and I were warm in our sleeping bags, but Karen, not so lucky. Morning has broken. The next section presents a huge climb of around 420 metres over a one hour period. Peter's powered ahead, he's very powerful up hills, goes slower down because of the blisters. Which now leaves us positioned high above our day's end destination, Honeysuckle Creek. And Karen's somewhere just behind. Over a long and steep climb, I never quite catch Pete. He turns and we decide to wait at that point for Karen. 1pm, we arrive at a wonderful parks ACT camping ground, Honeysuckle Creek, with plenty of tank water, park benches and toilets. What a treat. This almost feels like civilization. I throw a stone at a large black crow as it swoops on a bag of backcountry dinners. It immediately rips into the bag. It's a great shot, heading directly towards the big crow. However, the stone ricochets off the corner of the bench and across the face of my Big Angus Fly Creek 2 beloved tent and slices open a hole along the side. Reality has struck, the damage is done. Oh, what's this little thing down here? What? Is that a repair patch? Oh, it is. Hmm. I don't know how that happened. Trevor. And then Karen walks a few hundred metres to the Honeysuckle Space Observation Centre. Where the moon landing was actually broadcast to the world from here. They received the um, video and the information and it was sent from here to Houston, Texas before it was sent around the world. Roast chicken, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, the best ones were the gourmet, which obviously I, I did chose. Choose. We get into our tents early ready for our final night's sleep, and then the last day on the trail. Mixed emotions, that's for sure. Today is the last day of our journey. We expect to arrive at the Ngambi Tourist Information Centre, Thara by 4pm. We decide to stroll through the 15 kilometres to the end in a relaxed fashion with breaks at our leisure. As Pete often says, what's the rush? Ironically, Pete, after stating that, is responsible for today's navigation and leads off first, setting an early cracking pace on a comfortable track, which has us passing the first five kilometres in under one hour. I'll never forget Pete's words, what's the hurry, then takes off like a bullet. So we'll have a stop at Cypress Pine Lookout and um, have a little bit, of, little bit of food, maybe lunch. 
And wow. then um, we can. So we're on the last page of the book. Further reading acknowledgements. That's it. This has been an exhausting and extraordinary adventure, and we are mindful and so grateful for all team members and supporters. A few hours go by and we stop near Cypress Pine Lookout, our last big descent of the journey for a one minute silence for Remembrance Day. We acknowledge all those who sacrificed so much for our freedom. One of those was Pete's grandfather who enlisted in September of 1941 at age 19. He flew 50 missions over Europe as an air gunner, also serving as a rear gunner in the Lancaster bombers a very dangerous position. He returned home in June 1945, deeply affected by his years of service. He married and raised a family of three boys and one girl, dying in his early 40s. We are so grateful for his sacrifice and service. Thunder suddenly roars from somewhere behind our mountain and the clouds overhead quickly darken. Karen googled the weather, declaring that a lightning storm was imminent. Pete decides to make a run for it down to Nagambi Visitor Centre to avoid possible lightning strikes or getting soaked. I am determined to pause in the mountains until Kim, Karen's parents, Kylie and the Canberra Times reporter have all arrived from Melbourne and Canberra respectively to welcome us in. Karen follows Pete down to ensure that Pete is okay. After five weeks in the wilderness, so will not arrive before they are ready to welcome us. After living in the wilderness with very few comforts and conveniences, aching backs, sore feet and knees, and lightweight camping food, a huge change is about to take place. Tomorrow, the serenity of the Alps will be just a memory, the relief and pleasure of escaping from plummeting temperatures, endless high climbs, Crawling into tents and warm sleeping bags will be replaced with busy evenings, phone calls, emails and the many responsibilities and commitments of our modern world. The expected thunderstorm did not eventuate. 3.30pm, Kim, Kylie and the reporter arrive and it's time to complete our journey. Soon at our fingertips will be unlimited resources, comforts, warmth and an abundance of delicious food. Turn on the tap, water flows in limitless quantities. Almost 10,000 has been raised for the Cathy Freeman Foundation, and that's the important factor. Without this special focus, it would have been just a hike. And there's nothing wrong with just a hike. So it's all over. What a magnificent experience. We acknowledge all who have battled this trail over the years. Most of all, we acknowledge the Cathy Freeman Foundation and all who work there for a greater cause than this trail can offer. Carleen Minnie from the Canberra Times greets us with a bottle of celebratory wine and a delicious slice. So grateful for Carleen's support and story. Thank you, Parks ACT also, for welcoming us in and presenting us with some gifts. The marker is now on our farm fence post at the entrance of our property in Jembrook, Victoria. May all children of this nation, no matter what race, social or financial status or background, somehow receive adequate education and employment opportunities, whatever that takes.